All right, uh, just fixing the, uh, the, the video there. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is lecture 18, the American system. And uh, the American system is going to be a system, a standard pretty much in place for much of the 19th century, even going into the, uh, into the uh, 20th century, that's going to inform um, American national development. It is largely going to be an economic system. And um, it is going to be the, um, the method by which the United States is going to become a very wealthy uh, and a very strong nation. So um, let's take a look. So uh, the essential question that we're going to deal with today is we're going to analyze the economic changes taking place in the United States in the early 19th century. This corresponds with uh, key concepts 4.1.1c and 4.2. So, moving along, before we can really get into this, uh, into this idea of the American system, we need to take a look at a Scotsman. Uh, his name was Adam Smith. And Adam Smith is, is going to have a profound influence on history. He's one of the great, uh, great thinkers, one of the most, uh, probably one of the most influential uh, uh, thinkers in modern history. Uh, and his philosophies are going to be largely economic, in, in, as far as we're concerned here. Um, and his great work is the Wealth of Nations, and the Wealth of Nations uh, what is, is going to be published in uh, 1776, uh, the same year of, um, of the Declaration of Independence, the same year of Common Sense, uh, and yet uh, the Wealth of Nations stands out even among these great works of literature. And the, the key component of, uh, of the Wealth of Nations is that it is a study of capitalism. And capitalism is, the, is an economic system in which individuals and private businesses uh, own the capital and use that capital to their advantage. Uh, it is a system of private property. This is very much an Enlightenment idea. Of course, um, John Locke refers to having a right to property. Well, if you have a right to property, you have a right to use that property to your advantage. And the gist of uh, Adam Smith's uh, economic philosophy is that for the most part you want to take the, the economy out of the hands of governments. You want to take the uh, economy out of the hands of kings in this case. Um, as you're well aware, the, uh, the predominant economic philosophy during this time is mercantilism. This idea that the economy runs for the good of the crown and consequently runs for the good of the nation. Um, Adam Smith is saying, well, no, we're going to come up with a different idea than this. What we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, how about we take the, uh, the emphasis of the economy and put it in the hands of free individuals making choices in a free market um, for their own best interest. And consequently, what would then happen is um, you would have individuals in the, within a marketplace who are going to maximize their gains and minimize their costs. So the person that is, um, is wanting to purchase a product is going to purchase, the, wants to purchase the highest quality product for the lowest possible cost, whereas the businessman who is selling the product is going to want to sell kind of the lowest quality product at the highest possible course, uh, cost, at least the cheapest product uh, for, the highest possible, for the highest possible price. And what's going to have to happen is that the consumer and the businessman is going to have to negotiate uh, in order to make an agreement. And in negotiating, the, uh, the businessman will ultimately end up selling a better quality product for a price that, uh, that's a little lower than what he wants. And the consumer is going to have to take a kind of a cheaper product um, for a little bit more than he wants to pay. But ultimately, you will find a happy medium in which you'll get the best quality product at the lowest possible price. And this is the idea behind uh, Adam Smith. It's also a matter of labor as well. Um, Adam Smith understood that that labor, your labor, your productive force, was a key part of uh, of um, of improving of improving your economy. Of course, it was your laborers who were ultimately going to be your consumers, and uh, and the same would, would hold true. Me as a worker, I am going to go to my boss. My boss wants to pay me a very small amount and wants to maximize my output. Uh, I want to minimize my output. I don't want to work as hard, but I do want to have a lot of money. So uh, I'm going to have to negotiate my labor with the person who is employing me, and optimally what will happen is I will uh, end up being able to get the best possible wage I can and work, uh, and, the, and my employer will get the most work out of me that, that, my, that, 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 that they can. Um, 
And this is the idea behind the wealth of nations, that these, that these open market decisions among individuals uh, would uh, end up with the, with the best possible consequence. Now, Adam Smith, be really, really careful. Uh, some people are taking Adam Smith's uh, ideas and bringing them to the moon. Uh, Adam Smith wasn't, uh, wasn't a purist in this. He understood that there was a tendency uh, in, uh, in capitalism for, in a capitalist society for monopolies. He understood that there was, uh, that there was, a, uh, there was a tendency for uh, powerful businesses to abuse their power. Um, so, but, uh, but for the most part, if you, uh, if you minimize the impact of, of uh, government on the markets, the market should run fairly smoothly. So this is going to become a, a centerpiece of this, uh, this American system. So we're going to start off, uh, as, we, as we talked about before, uh, Thomas Jefferson is going to win the election of 1800. The Democratic Republicans will become, will become the dominant party at this point, and the Federalists will spend the next 10 years or so uh, trying to uh, make a comeback, but they won't be able to do that. Now, one of the things that I forgot to mention in Lecture 17 that was part of your notes, <laughs> my bad, um, is that uh, the, the key split in the Federalist Party was actually not over economics or politics in general, but was actually over warfare. Uh, it was, there were a number of people in, um, in the Federalist Party who wanted to actually go to war with France uh, over some of the things that were going on with the conflict, the kind of the, uh, uh, the Cold War that was existing between the United States and France. Um, and then there were folks like John Adams who had no desire to go to war with France, and that created a split in the party, and that, uh, that allowed the Democratic Republicans to kind of move in. Either way, uh, the, um, the, uh, the economic destiny, especially of the United States, and to a certain extent the political destiny, uh, although we're going to talk about some Federalist influences even despite the, um, the fact that they were not, no longer in power, uh, is going to be dominated by the Jeffersonians for, uh, say, about the next 15, uh, you know, almost 20 years or so. Um, It'll become a period of time known as the uh, as the Virginia Dynasty. Of course, uh, you know Thomas Jefferson being a Virginian, James Madison, James Monroe being Virginians as well. Who they'll be the presidents to follow. Now, um, Jefferson's economic idea. Jefferson uh, Jefferson was actually more influenced by um, by a British uh, philosopher called Thomas Malthus, who was very concerned that population was growing faster than our ability to produce food, and that ultimately there were physical limitations to how much. Uh, how much we could grow economically or even uh, physically that eventually uh, we would out we would outpopulate ourselves and then we wouldn't be able to eat and then that would cause uh, starvation warfare and things like that that would knock down our population <coughs> Jefferson saw it a little bit differently Jefferson took a look at the United States and all of the vast room and the vast frontier that the United States had and said well yeah those uh, those ideas are a real problem in England where there's a limited amount of, uh, of land but in the United States, where we have all the land we want, um, we have the perfect makeup for what Jefferson referred to as an agrarian republic. This uh, ideal, the ideal world that Jefferson saw was one in which a bunch of, um, you know, a, a country of yeoman farmers, relatively small, self-sufficient, um, economically productive farmers, in Adam Smith's case, working to their own self-interest, self working in their own benefit, um, would create a, the maximum opportunity for, for freedom and for self-sufficiency and for communi uh, community arrangement. Uh, this, was, uh, this was, of course, Jefferson's idea of an agrarian republic, which, of course, would preclude a guy like Jefferson, because Jefferson was far from being a yeoman farmer. He was a huge plantation owner who owned many, many slaves. Um, and that was not a part of his agrarian republic, but uh, maybe he would have adapted, but he shows no signs of, of having that desire. Um, according to Jefferson, the benefits of this would be that, um, that a, a, a nation of farmers would not be dependent upon outside forces, would not be dependent on, say, foreign trade with Britain or France and other countries that may be hostile to the interests of the United States. Another... Um, aspect of this is that a community of farmers would be getting together and they would share uh, in their needs, share in their, um, in, their, in their bounties and become a community of free people. 
Um, so Jefferson's idea is very much, uh, you know, represented in this picture here, the, the small independent uh, yeoman farmer, um, you know, a rugged individual who is able to, to care for himself and provide, help provide for his community. Um, unfortunately for, uh, for Jeffersonian economists, uh, this is going to neglect a huge segment of the population. Think about the Adamses and the uh, and the huge merchant houses uh, that were ex in existence during uh, during this time. Also, think about the large plantation owners like Thomas Jefferson. Um, but also, there was a growing little corner segment of the United States that was dedicated to manufacturing and to industry. And of course, there was no room for manufacturing and industry uh, in a, in a Jeffersonian agrarian republic. Of course. Um, industry and manufacturing is going to require trade with outside, with outside countries for uh, raw materials and also for open markets, and that's something that the Jeffersonians weren't particularly interested in. Um, another shortcoming of this, uh, of this idea of the, uh, of the agrarian republic was because the United States had so much room to expand into at this point, uh, there wasn't an awful lot of uh, time and energy put into caring for the environment and for the local ecology, um, which is actually ultimately going to lead to a breakdown in community, right? I mean, if you tear up your soil and then it, if, you, if you have no reason to take care of your soil and take care of your land because you know that you can always pack up your bags and move into the West and take some land from Indians, um, eh, why take care of your land? Why put the extra effort and, and, uh, and cost into doing that? So, uh, so this is a bit of a drawback for, for Jefferson's, uh, Jefferson's ideas. Now, one of the, uh, probably one of the most important things to come out of the Jefferson administration economically, uh, socially, and culturally is the Louisiana Purchase. Um, this was uh, Napoleon. Uh, this was a time where uh, the uh, the French dictator Napoleon is going to uh, take control of the French Revolution and ultimately become a almost an absolute monarch uh, in France itself. And this is going to be a time of very intense warfare between Britain and France, uh, among other nations in in Europe. And Jefferson was very concerned about this, especially when. Um, he discovered that Napoleon had kind of made a backroom deal with the, uh, with the Spanish, shortly before, of course, invading Spain, um, in which the Louisiana Territory, Louisiana, uh, would, Spanish Louisiana, would be um, given back to the French. Um, well, this was a real problem for Jefferson. Jefferson was very concerned about this because there was animosity that was existing between the French and the Americans at this point over American neutrality uh, in their war with Britain. So, uh, so Jefferson was concerned about this. He was also very, very concerned that uh, French possession of Louisiana would seal off uh, the Mississippi River from American shipping. And this would be a huge, huge problem for, American, uh, for, for the American economy. So, um, fortunately for Jefferson, of course, he sends, um, he sends uh, some emissaries to, um, to, uh, to go to France to negotiate a treaty. Among them was, uh, was James Monroe. Uh, and he is going to, um, he's going to, um, uh, oh, and, and Robert Livingston, I'm sorry, I was trying to think of the name. Uh, and Robert Livingston to sends them to France to negotiate. At least let us have access to the Mississippi River. At least let us get our, our, um, our products through New Orleans, which was a major trade city. And he's going to send them there to negotiate with Napoleon. However, what they found is that actually Napoleon was kind of stuck. Um, he was really kind of hoping to expand his empire into Louisiana, but he had a problem. Uh, before uh, Napoleon had come into power, there was a revolution in, in Haiti uh, that was inspired by the American Revolution. It was actually a slave revolution, one of the first, probably the, the first, and I, as, to my knowledge, the only successful uh, slave revolution in uh, world history that overthrew the French government. And Napoleon tried to send an army to, uh, to Haiti to, uh, to take over, to, to retake that, the, the island of Hispaniola and put it back into French dominion, and he failed. His army was, uh, was humiliated, uh, largely um, decimated by disease, uh, and ended up having to leave. So he had lost Haiti. And by losing Haiti, he lost his ability to really expand his empire into Louisiana. And at the same time, Napoleon was also involved in many uh, wars. He was, uh, of course, in a constant state of warfare with Britain, but he also was under the, uh, you know, in the circumstances in which Austria and Prussia, and, um, and uh, he was having some 
some problems in Spain, a lot of, uh, a lot of problems in trying to contr control and contain Spain. Um, he needed money. He needed money to pay his soldiers uh, to continue to fight their wars. So what Napoleon decided to do is he decided to sell Louisiana to the United States. Uh, you know, Livingston and Monroe were just awestruck, but um, he makes this offer. And uh, Livingston and Monroe, well, remember, it takes about a month or, two, uh, or over a month for them to communicate with their government in, in, uh, in the United States and then get that message back to them to determine what to do. So Monroe and Livingston, given this, this tremendous opportunity, something like $15 million, it was just pennies per, per acre for this Louisiana territory, they jumped at it, they bought it. Um, this is going to cause a political problem for Jefferson, a bit of a political problem for Jefferson, because uh, now Jefferson thought this was a great idea. He definitely wanted to buy this Louisiana territory. However, uh, remember Thomas Jefferson was a strict constructionist. Uh, he believed that the Constitution should be followed strictly as written. Uh, no deviation. Oh, dang it. There's nothing in the Constitution that empowers the president to purchase territory. Uh, that is something that has to be approved by Congress. But, of course, they didn't have time to approve this by Congress. So, um, so they just kind of did it anyway. Uh, and uh, at least momentarily speaking, Jefferson became a loose constructionist uh, and, and purchased the territory uh, anyway. Uh, and there's going to be a little bit of a brouhaha over that. Uh, the Federalists, of course, pointing fingers. So, yeah, he, uh, he's, he's a hypocrite. Well, yeah. Um, and... Um, but you know what? The Louisiana was Louisiana territory was such a a uh, such a great opportunity that nobody complained all that much, at least not for a while. Um, now, some of the social consequences of this is that um, is that uh, well, for uh, for one thing, uh, this was this this allowed for tremendous expansion into the West. This this gave us an idea of of even moving further into the West, uh, ultimately having some negative environmental consequences. But also, it's, it's going to become kind of an expectation of Americans that we're going to be able to move west. Uh, we developed this frontier mentality um, that, according to uh, historian... Um, uh, oh, I can't, now I can't think of his name. Anyway, I'll talk about him later. Um, th th this, this frontier mentality is going to, be co going to be born with the purchase of the Louisiana Territory. Um, and, um, and, of course, uh, we're going to have to map this territory out. We're going to have to see exactly how far we're going. And as far as uh, Jefferson's concerned, maybe we can kind of push these territorial bounds maybe to the Pacific Ocean, which is not according to the map. We'll see in just a moment uh, as far as the Louisiana Territory went. To do this, um, Jefferson commissions Lewis and Clark uh, to, uh, to map out the territory and to kind of inc help incorporate these folks into the United States. Another consequence of this is that the United States now is in a position where it is going to have to start incorporating other people into its country. Um, this is, you know, for the most part, this is a very English-based uh, society. If you were English, that was it. Uh, Indians were largely excluded from this, uh, from this society, but now the United States has this huge piece of territory that contains people of Spanish origin, people of, uh, of French origin, people of mixed origin. We've got the Acadians who had been kicked out of Canada and had settled down in New Orleans. Um, becoming Cajuns, uh, there was a, there were an awful. I mean, New Orleans was a global city at the time, and the United States is going to have to figure out a way to incorporate those people into the United States. It's not enough to just push them out like it had been done with Native Americans. Um, you, the United States is going to have to figure out oh, how to assimilate these particular groups into American culture, which is always a bit of a give or take. Uh, this is, of course, a map of the Louisiana Territory, and as you can see by making this purchase, um, the United States almost doubled its territory. Um, you know, this is really, really huge. Now, remember, these, this Northwest Territory is also still largely frontier. Um, it is said that, uh, that when questioned as to why he sold this territory, Napoleon responded that he, I have given England an enemy she will not defeat. I have put a backbone into a very large jellyfish. Um... And um, anyway, moving along. Uh, now, Jefferson is going to continue to have this problem with the French and, of course, the British. Both sides have a real problem with American neutrality. Uh, France, because of our military, previous military alliance, and also Britain, because we are the, you know, Britain is our largest trade partner, uh, despite the fact that we've had some problems with the British. 
Um, so Jefferson decides to engage in something called commercial warfare. Look, he knows that the United States militarily is not strong enough uh, to get involved in this in this war. He's kind of on the side of Adams here. That getting involved in a war is not a, not a particularly good idea. Uh, so what he's hoping to do is, he knows that the United States is a major, major supplier of, uh, of goods and, and resources for both France and England, and what, especially England. And what he's hoping to do is kind of force them to recognize American neutrality. So he engages in what's called commercial warfare, using the power of your market uh, to affect a, some kind of a political change. Um, and he's going to institute uh, the Embargo Act of 1807. The Embargo Act of 1807 is going to prohibit U.S. ships from sailing to any other foreign port and doing business with any other, with foreign countries. Uh, it's going to sharply, sharply cur curtail U.S. trade. Um, unfortunately. Um, for, for Jefferson and for the United States, this is going to be a really, really bad idea. Britain has other sources of, uh, of, of raw materials and resources. They don't have to use the United States. The United States is just convenient. So um, they don't. They just go their own merry way. And as far as the rest of the, uh, the countries, they were able to find other uh, places to trade. And it really didn't affect France or England all that much. But it had a devastating impact on American business. American business would no, no longer had the market that they, uh, that they uh, were used to. They had to reduce their prices. It was just a mess. It, it was a, a very bad economic policy overall. Um, and, you know, consequently, uh, the United States is going to have to figure out some other things to do. So, over time, what's going to end up happening, of course, this is 1807, toward the end of, uh, of uh, Jefferson's presidency. Uh, he will be followed by his, uh, his protege, James Madison, the father of the Constitution. And under James Madison, uh, Congress will pass the Non-Intercourse Act of 1809. Uh, and this is going to say, all right, you know what, we're going to trade with everybody else, but we're not going to trade with Britain or France until they, d they end their hostilities. Yeah, well, that doesn't work all that well either. So ultimately, we're going to uh, uh, pass uh, something called Macon's, Bi Macon's uh, Bill Number 2 in 1810. And Macon's Bill said, look... Um, We'll trade with Britain or France uh, as soon as they recognize our neutrality. And, it, you know, we kind of scaled this back. Of course, none of these pieces of legislation actually worked. Um, but they did kind of relieve some of that, that economic stress that was placed on American merchants. Um, now... Uh, the, the time period after Madison, Madison, of course, we'll talk about, we're going to talk about the War of 1812 later on. Of course, there's a huge war that's going to take place during this time period. But, um, but ultimately, in 1816, um, uh, James Monroe will be elected president, uh, and, and James Monroe is going to have a very different kind of a strategy. Um, for the most part, at this stage of the game, the Federalists, as a party, are pretty much ceasing to exist. Uh, they're done, which means there's only really one political party at this time, the Democratic Republicans, of which James Monroe was one. And he's saying, and, J and James Monroe's thinking, you know what we're going to do? Let's incorporate the Federalists into the Democratic Republican Party and become just kind of the National Republicans. Um, and this is exactly what he did. He appointed Federalists to, uh, to his cabinet. He... he uh, he adopted and embraced some Federalist ideas, and this is going to usher in a brief period of American, uh, uh, American politics known as the Era of Good Feelings. It's very, very rare that we can say in American history that we had an Era of Good Feelings. Um, but for the most part, this, this was the case under, under Monroe. Um, and, um, and one of the things that, that was of benefit to this, of course, this was of huge economic benefit to the United States because for the first time in, in American history, we really had pretty much a consensus on how to run the country. Um, the Democratic Republicans had kind of adopted some of the Federalist ideas that were the least objectionable to them. Uh, the Federalists were pretty happy with that. Um, they had let go of some of their ideas. Uh, the the uh, Democratic Republicans are also going to kind of infuse the, their own little spin on some of these things. And for the most part, at least for a brief period of time, the United States will be in a political consensus. And that political consensus also, it was a consensus over economic policy. How are we going to get the nation to grow? And these plans were put into place. And it was almost as if we were taking some of the best ideas of the Federalists and incorporating them into the Democratic Party. 
Um, and in this will become known as the American system. Right? So uh, now our, our chief proponent of this American system was this, uh, this gentleman here uh, by the name of Henry Clay. Uh, he also had, for the most part, had support of the president, James Monroe. Um, and this is going to be a huge, huge uh, change in economic policy. Um, the core features of this American system was everybody right now, Democratic Republicans and Federalists, um, were in favor of a national bank to help regulate uh, the currency and to provide loans and to, uh, to provide investments for economic development. Both uh, parties had decided this was a good idea. There was a, the, um, the original charter for the first bank of the United States had run out. We had gone through a period where we didn't really have a national bank. And now, um, you know, both parties, well, the, the remaining party is going to adopt this Federalist idea and say, you know what, maybe a national bank wasn't a bad idea after all. Another idea was tariffs. Placing tariffs on imports. Now, Adam Smith had some real problems with this idea of, uh, of placing tariffs. Adam Smith believed in relatively low taxes. Um, but Adam Smith also believed that there was a, a, an invisible hand that would automatically protect your nation's uh, industries, uh, they, uh, you know, leading uh, the, uh, the people of your particular country to purchase your, your products uh, or purchase products from their own country, even if those products were a little bit eh, more expensive. Um, yeah, well, there really wasn't all that much of a history to support that. Um, during this time, uh, the, there's going to be an emphasis on, hey, let's, let's develop our manufacturing by placing, um, by placing tariffs, especially on British goods. Uh, once the War of 1812 came to an end, there was a glut of British goods on the, on the U.S. market. They were very cheap, and they were very, very plentiful, and they were very easy to get, and they were really, really hurting American manufacturing. So manu American manufacturers and industrialists and the people who invest in those industries were saying, whoa, we need to do something to protect this. And by placing a tariff on imported goods, uh, we can raise the price of, uh, of our British competitors and be able to compete with them more effectively and build our own industries. Um, and finally... Uh, there was this idea that the, one, of the, one of the functions of the government should be to invest in infrastructure, in national, uh, in, in basically a national backbone, uh, roads, bridges, canals, uh, railroads, and things along those lines, things that bind the nation together. Uh, this is not necessarily in the, uh, in the Constitution, but it, it's going to be understood that, hey, you know what, uh, Americans need this, and really... <laughs> Private individuals are not going to build a road that everybody can use. Why would you build a road and, and let everybody else use it for free? No, the nation needs to invest in these things because they're good for business and they're good for society. So is this idea of, uh, of a national system of roads and canals and infrastructure. Now, James Monroe was not a fan of this particular idea. Um, he did not, he's, it was, remember, he's kind of a strict constructionist in the Jeffersonian tradition, and he doesn't see that that, that is uh, the responsibility of the country. It's, he, he believed that that was the responsibility of the states. Um, ultimately, uh, the, under, with, with the force of Henry Clay and the support of the President of the United States, um, the, uh, the United States will, develop, will create and charter its second bank of the United States, uh, keeping, maintaining that, that strong, um, that stable currency. And also they will put into effect the, um, the, the tariff of 1816. This is the very, very first protective tariff in American history uh, to protect American manufacturing. And, it, and it'll work. American manufacturing will grow and will develop under these conditions. Uh, now, what do I mean by infrastructure? Now, one of the uh, probably one of the key um, one of the key successes of the American system was the tremendous investments that were placed in American infrastructure. Well, infrastructure are those things are those physical things that actually tie the country and hold the country together. So, when I say infrastructure, uh, I mean roads and bridges and canals and uh, and railroads and um, and nowadays we can think of electrical cables and plumbing and uh, and sewer systems and things along those lines. All of these things that, that are, are a national investment or a social investment in make, making life a little bit better for all of us is part of uh, this, this idea of infrastructure. And 
infrastructure is going to be absolutely crucial to the American system uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, this infrastructure is going to stimulate investment in industries and, and in business. Also, the, uh, the development of this in infrastructure will expand markets and, uh, and will also further U.S. expansion into the territories and, and development of these resources that were existing further away from the coast and into the west. Um, this was crucial to the development of the American economy. And most, you know, most um, politicians in most states are going to go along with it. Because if you walk over to a congressman from Connecticut and say, hey, how about we build a road across your state that's going to, do, to create jobs and develop your economy, um, that senator or that representative is going to say, let's do it. Well, okay, but we'll do that for you if you uh, do it for me in South Carolina. All right. Sold, sold. We're going to get it done. Uh, so this was very, very popular among politicians during this time, uh, kind of bringing home that bacon, so to speak. Um, some examples of these... Uh, of, of, this, uh, of this infrastructure, as I, as I said earlier, uh, during this time, roads, national roads. It was very difficult to move around during this time period, and developing roads, uh, also, you know, especially roads that were you know, of high quality, was very, very important. Um, canals and expanded waterways. Of course, the United States is bound by rivers already, but sometimes it's a matter of just connecting one waterway to another waterway really makes it work. We're going to see an example of this in just a moment. Um, and also uh, railroads. Uh, there was a brand new invention, uh, you know, called the locomotive, and that is going to help bind the country and expand, uh, you know, over the next half century or so. Um, and the consequences of these investments... Um, is is just it's hard to you know boil down. But think about this: um, when you are doing something like investing in railroads, so for instance, well, first of all, it's going to make it easier to get around. Okay, it's going to make it much easier and much faster to move around. Also, uh, if it's much easier and much faster to move around, you can ship your goods cheaper, which means that your goods are more competitive with other goods in other areas, and this is going to expand business opportunities. It is also going to spur investments um, in, um, in this infrastructure. Think about this. If, um, if you're going to build railroads, well, then you have to develop your, your iron industry. So that means that people who are going to invest are going to say, hey, look, they're, they're building railroads. This is a good time to invest in things like iron. Um, and uh, and this, these investments are going to pay off, providing for more capital, providing for even more investments. It was also a good way of getting people to work, getting people um, to, to actually do the work to, uh, to, build, these, uh, to, to build these particular projects. Um, and also, by, um, by, by creating this infrastructure that allows us to communicate better with other areas in the country, it's a way of binding the country together. Remember, one of the challenges that the United States had as a result of the Louisiana Purchase was, it was in how to assimilate um, outside groups. It would have been very, very difficult to do if we had a seaboard nation and a frontier nation uh, and a kind of a western nation. Uh, it would have been very easy to create dissension there. But, but since there was relatively easy travel back and forth, it was much easier to create a solid American culture under these circumstances. So, um, so all of this is, um, is really, really valuable. So let's take... Take a look at some examples here. So, uh, in, in the way of roads, probably one of the great great road projects of this time was called the Cumberland Road. And the Cumberland Road is going to connect Cumberland, uh, Maryland, to uh, Vandalia, Illinois. I mean, this is this is huge. Now, remember, this is these areas at this time was frontier land. This is uh, this is relatively undeveloped territory, but it's not going to be undeveloped for very long because of the Cumberland Road. Now, if you take a look at this image of the Cumberland Road here. I don't have my magic pen right now, but you, you take a look at that image and what you'll see is that what they're doing is they're digging this road and they're laying it with gravel, making it a much more efficient uh, means of, of moving around. Of course, if you're covered with gravel, that means that when you're taking wagons and bringing wagons and stuff west, um, you're not getting bogged down in mud, you're, you're, not, getting, uh, you're not getting stuck, you're, uh, you're not hitting big roots and rocks that are going to tear your... Uh, tear your wagon apart. This is a much, much more efficient system of moving around, and it is going to help to develop all of these cities that are going to um, appear along this Cumberland Road. Look at the cities, right? Um, Wheeling, Springfield, Indianapolis, uh, Terre Haute. 
I, I mean, all, these, are, these are all major, major cities. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're going to rise along this, this Cumberland Road. Uh, this Cumberland Road is also going to bind, you know, country, uh, states like Virginia and Pennsylvania to, um, to as far as the Mississippi River uh, in, uh, in Illinois. Take a look at this. This is uh, probably the iconic uh, public works project of the time. It was the Erie Canal. And the Erie Canal is, uh, is, intended, to, um, is intended to link, in essence, New York City up the Hudson River, across the, uh, the Erie Canal, uh, into Lake Ontario, which then opens up the rest, you know, the rest of the Great Lakes uh, to trade. What a huge, huge boon. Of course, somebody purchases buying and selling goods in New York City is now able to go uh, all the way to Buffalo uh, and all the way to, to uh, other areas. Canada, conduct trade along the St. Lawrence River. I mean, this opens up vast, vast territories in just the building of this canal. This canal was over 300 miles long. It was it, nothing like this had ever been, a ch had been tried before. Um, you know, people referred to this as, as, a, as the big ditch. Uh, you know, uh, they didn't think this was going to work, but ultimately it does work, and it's going to be a huge, huge bane, to, uh, a huge, huge boon to the American economy. Um, and uh, of course, with these expanded waterways, we also have another new uh, technology for Eng Englishman Robert Fulton. Here is going to invent the steamboat, and uh, and the, these. Uh, I don't know. No. Uh, anyway, I don't. Now I can't remember if Robert Fulton was English or not. But either way, uh, the steamboat is, uh, is going to make uh, transportation along these waterways much more efficient and much faster. Of course, the, the benefit of having a steam engine rather than sails and, uh, is that uh, you can work against the wind. You can, and uh, you can work against the current rather than trying to pull against the current, which is a horribly inefficient way of traveling anybody who is, uh, is into canoeing and boating. Um, and ultimately, the locomotive. The mo locomotive is, you know, the initial uh, investment here. There was about a 13-mile stretch of uh, of train track was the initial investment, and this, within about uh, 40 years or so, is going to turn into over 30,000 uh, miles of railroad track. Uh, this is going to bind many of our major cities together, and it's going to ins uh, spur other industries, other not just railroads, but iron, glass, rubber, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, other industries that are going to develop as a result of, uh, of the automotive. And uh, you get a sense here by you looking at this, this is a, a fascinating chart. And what this chart actually shows is improvements in travel and transportation in the United States um, between uh, 1800 and I believe that says 18, what is it, 1857. Uh, so if you take a look at around 1800, uh, you'll notice that this, this pink area here, um, this is relative to New York City. So if you're living in New York City and you wanted to travel to, um, you know, to, to say, uh, oh, let's, let's just put you in, uh, send you to Boston, um, it's going to take you about, you know, about, uh, what does it say, about four days for you to travel from New York to Boston. Um, but now, now take a look at What's going to happen as a result of all this infrastructure investment? If you're living in New York City, you can travel to Boston within a day. Within the same amount of time, within four days, you can be all the way over here into, uh, into Ohio. I'm sorry, uh, Iowa. And, um, you know, and way past the Mississippi River. Uh, this is a huge, huge benefit. And, and you can imagine the, uh, the kind of economic benefits that are going to come from this more efficient, more effective means of travel. So anyway, uh, this is a, a brief synopsis of the American system. Of course, you know, during this time period, there's a lot of stuff going on, and we're going to touch upon all of this stuff as we go along throughout this particular theme. So, uh, so keep an eye on this stuff and take a look at it yourself, and uh, I will talk to you with Lecture 19 later on.